Dr. Justin Panic is an associate profession, professor of psychology at Colorado Technical University and adjunct faculty for Blue Cliff College. He holds an MED in, in instructional technology, an MS in counseling, and a PhD in health psychology. He, he is an individual couples and family therapist, as well as an ecotherapist providing therapy on a 70-acre farm and often takes clients on mushroom forages using the rich metaphors nature provides in the therapeutic process. He also works as a behavioral health consultant at a rural medicine clinic outside of Portland, Oregon, providing alternative healing modalities and nutritional interventions alongside a team of physicians and nurses treating patients with cancer, diabetes, obesity, and other health issues. His last, uh, sorry, his current research includes consciousness, altered states, dreams, ethnopharmacology and plant medicines, shamanism, mythology, and alchemy, spirituality, and behavioral health. His last research study involved the effects of ayahuasca on consciousness, spirituality, and stress coping, which was later published as a book titled Ethnopharmacology and Stress Relief. Please welcome to the stage, Justin Panic. So, uh, I was eating a jam and egg sandwich the other day. Uh, that's jam, not ham. Uh, which could be tasty. Um, the bread of which was whole grain, 20 seed farm bread, hand forged by an 80 year old German peasant woman during a solar eclipse. And, uh, the jam of which was biodynamic, whereby the berries were blessed by the spirit of Rudolf Steiner and uh, placed with an energized crystal in a cow horn and buried deep in the soil during a full moon in the appropriate planetary astral alignment. Uh, and the eggs of which were uh, born of chickens that were not only free range, but at one time or another had suitors with cool hipster names like Levi or Garrett or whatever. Uh, and then I realized why does everyone always know the egg terms except me? Sunny side down, uh, you know, hard up. So I, I never know the egg terms. Uh, so I'm always like, I don't know, leaky moon rise, exploding super egg nova, aborted bird ovum surprise. I just start making shit up at that point. Uh, so I was in a, this little hip uh, college town restaurant uh, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last year. I don't know. Time is slippery. Um, anyway, that's where I do a lot of my research, uh, bars, cafes, restaurants, and uh, ordered the Korean burrito with a side of sushi rolls. Uh, Koreans are masters of, of culinary funk. And as I looked down at my burrito and my sushi rolls, I was reminded of the reality carnival Cliff Pickover's observation that a single glance at a sushi roll can transport one into a vast hyperdynamic swirl of worlds within worlds. So there I was, sent off on a space rocket to Strange Town. A universe filled with fractals and infinite bifurcation and mirror worlds and uh, Monkeys wearing salmon tuxedos, riding flaming narwhals, and uh, diamond-encrusted oceans with fish covered in seaweed rice jackets, majestically leaping out and into my gaping word hole. Worlds within worlds, cities within cells, deconstructing reality word for word, pixel for pixel from heaven to hell. Would this not lead to an infinite regress? A nightmarish Korbinski in realm where maps become territories. Ink polluted water. Legends like angry natives that steer one away from that well-trodden path of human habit. For many years I dreamt, up, uh, dreamt of curling up and living in a map. In fact, I often use one of my maps as a blanket. Uh, invariably leading to swashbuckling dreams of conquering lands and exchanging assorted recipes with noble savages. Ask you guys, uh, uh -oh. um, you ever go for that traditional handshake and the other person's coming in with different plans? Like you've got the open hand and they've got the fist, but then you realize you're looking in the mirror. 
Did you know that when quietly sitting, doing nothing, spring comes and grass grows by itself? Seriously, I, I researched it. A little piece of advice. If you walk, just walk. If you sit, just sit. But whatever you do, don't wobble. Unless it's party time. Then wobbling is par for the course and perhaps even encouraged. Now, all this may or may not make sense now or later on. But if it doesn't, later on or now, it likely never will. Which is perfectly okay. Don't worry about it. All right, good afternoon, everyone. That was my little warm-up. I always do warm-ups just to kind of get in the groove here. So uh, I'm Justin. I also go by uh, 6079 Panic J, uh, former clerk in the records department of the Ministry of Truth. Uh, and uh, current Brotherhood scri scribe and resistance officer who sometimes speaks out against the crimes of the thought police. So a different title I think that's listed. Um, I'm always changing titles around a little bit. Um, so dismantling the spell of the yellow electric emperor. Sounds kind of crazy. Um, it's going to make more sense as I go through this, but really what this comes from, the inspiration was uh, from many ayahuasca sessions, and I know uh, likely many of you who do ayahuasca or any other entheogen, you see uh, symbols, uh, archetypes. Uh, so I, I was kind of on this research mission to find out uh, what several of these symbols were, and one was incredibly simple. I'll show you a slide of it uh, here in a bit, but it was just uh, imagine a, a, a line, a straight line that's tilted at a 45 degree angle. That was it. Just that one thing kept showing up. Um, so this is the result of, of that investigation. It's going to get, get a little sciencey, and you might begin to ponder, you know, the psychedelic connection. Um, but all this comes from, you know, my sessions with ayahuasca. It's kind of like going to a mystery school. It's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, and then I'm going to tie it into with, um, you know, my work as a, a psychologist and how it relates to the human. Uh, social realm, and all that. So um, let me kind of just break down some terms here. Okay, so uh, Yellow Emperor Spell. So by this I'm referring to, um, so what I'm going to be talking about actually is this uh, kind of discovery of mirror worlds. How, uh, and I've always been interested in shadow work and, you know, this balance of, of light and dark and um and uh, so this is going to be about mirror worlds. And what I'm going to do is kind of take you uh, on a trip through this timeline of history, starting at a time when um, there was this sort of um, beautiful balance of, of, of light and dark, of chaos and order. So the Yellow Emperor's spell kind of refers to this suppression uh, of this mirror world of chaos. It's, it's about order and linearity. Uh, so in ancient times, human order lived in this kind of uh, uneasy alliance, right? Um, but this began to change with the emergence of order, science, categorization, uh, philosophical ideologies, and so on. Chirality, um, for those who are chemists or scientists who probably are familiar with this term, uh, we see this throughout nature and quite often in the psychedelic session. Um, and this means asymmetric in such a way that the, the um, structure and its mirror image are not superimposable, as you can kind of see on the slide. Uh, when we examine mythology, nature, the cosmos, human behavior, um, we find pairs of opposites uh, of this vast mirror world, uh, as well as very specific and recurrent themes, right? Feedback iteration, irregularity, infinite bifurcation which actually make up fractals uh, and is kind of a substrate of the living matrix. And that's why you know, fractals are um, heavily represented in psychedelic art and why we see them so often. So there's both order and chaos is what I began to kind of uh, uncover in my investigation. And what we find in this constant mirror world is that randomness is interwoven with order, uh, simplicity enfolds complexity, Right, order and chaos can be repeated at smaller and smaller scales, giving us those lovely fractals. So 
the ancients uh, believed that the forces of chaos and order were a part of this uneasy tension. You had, a, you had a harmony or reciprocity. Chaos was something immense and creative from which life burst forth. Um, we actually see this even in you know the uh, creation myths and, and religion, uh, the struggle of the deity against the powers of uh, chaos, where God's struggle with uh, chaos is perhaps an internal struggle, right? Uh, embodying chaos as much as order. God, the whirlwind, the fiery destruction, you know, the bringer of plagues and floods. So the creator is operating from this shadowy boundary line between order and chaos. Um, and, uh, you know, in uh, Eastern religious traditions, you have this this nice balance. Brahma, the creator on the right, Shiva, the destroyer on the left, and Vishnu standing at the fulcrum kind of thing. Um, and if you look at the word religion, religare means to re-relate, uh, healing the wounds of separation. Uh, so uh, a lot of the, the, the lessons from this mirror world is about um, uh, balance, right? So, uh, and you know, the ancient Greeks really were in touch with that shadow in a different way. Um, they understood that you know the need to honor all parts of the psyche, uh, especially the shadow aspects, right, which were worshipped as autonomous gods and goddesses. And they knew if you ignored you know those gods or goddesses, they would give you a serious ass whooping, right. So the the personal shadow represents a collection of these kind of disowned parts. Now in the Middle Ages, kind of going further um, towards the modern times, the Middle Ages. Uh, the medieval hermetics, uh, my favorite group of people, uh, alchemists, right? They they exemplified the struggle with uh, chaos and order. They mingled, you know, Gnosticism, uh, Christianity, Persian, Babylonian, Egyptian theologies, uh, believing in creation from this sort of pre-existing chaos that was grotesque and absurd and irrational. You know, darkness was life-producing. Um, Encounters with monsters were revitalizing. Um, creation was a sort of ever renewing process, as above, so below, right? Um, and then, moving further ahead, after uh, Galileo, uh, Kepler, Descartes, Newton, uh, you know, the math cops and party crashers, I call them, uh, the further suppression of chaos. So, disorder was kind of imprisoned and forced to reflect the gestures of this universal order uh, where reductionism became kind of like the you know the watchmaker's view of nature uh, and then uh, in as early as the mid 18th century uh, scientists were kind of scratching their heads trying to figure out uh, this perpetual motion uh, machine so into entropy thermodynamics uh, entropy challenged the encoding order and brought up this notion that, hey, chaos could be as powerful as order. Uh, and then in the 19th century, you had uh, you know these engineers building the new bridges and steamships and, and other tech marvels. Um, uh, and they repeatedly encountered disorder uh, in the form of you know abrupt changes that were quite unlike the, the slow growth of entropy. Uh, plates buckled, materials fractured, that kind of thing. And then nonlinear or differential equations were used to um, probe this chaos, which would further mask the chaos a little bit, kind of keep the spell of the Yellow Emperor alive a little bit longer. Um, but then in the 1950s, uh, scientists took note of positive feedback. Um, so a good example of positive feedback is taking this microphone and putting it up next to the speaker, and it creates that loud, um, ear-splitting screech. Um, and it's interesting if you've ever been to like a punk show, whether it's traditional punk or punk nouveau, they do that very thing where they put a mic up to the loudspeaker, which is kind of interesting. It's like this kind of unconscious way to forge a bridge, right, from from the, the shadowy chaos of punk elements to a linear order of, of society. Um, but these two basic types of uh, feedback, both positive and negative, uh, are everywhere at all levels of living systems. Uh, the evolution of ecology, the moment-by-moment -moment psychology of our social interactions, um, the mathematical terms of nonlinear equations. So cybernetics and high-speed computers, when they were developed, would, were, were used to kind of probe these uh, 
uh, nonlinear equations. And this made positive negative feedback loops popular in science. And this embodies that tension between order and chaos, uh, kind of the slow rediscovery of that ancient mirror world. Uh, and so the idea was that any randomness and chaos disturbing a system could only come from outside the system. They were wrong. So then enter the great Poincaré, the French uh, scientist, polymath, uh, Oz Curtain Opener, um, who kind of knew the palace secret, right? Um, so for a system that only contained two bodies, like celestial bodies, Newton's equations work fine, but you throw in any other factors, a third body, it kind of just falls apart, doesn't work. So uh, Poincaré, another uh, theoretical physicist, then developed this perturbation theory, uh, which revealed that even with the smallest kind of perturbation, uh, systems explode into you know, kind of shocking complexity. I think that's actually, the answer is 42, by the way. This is all in green. So then enter uh, Max Planck and Einstein with their party hats and sunglasses and quantum mechanics, you know, which brought some very troubling paradoxes, um, like how an elementary particle of light uh, can exist uh, can exist as a particle or a wave. Um, and then, um, you know, the double slit experiment, for those who are aware of that, that's the day that consciousness entered into the laboratory. Uh, pretty mind-blowing stuff. Um, uh, and then enter David Baum, who was uh, the American physicist, uh, philosopher, who theorized that the universe must be fundamentally indivisible, a flowing wholeness, right, where the observer cannot be separated from the observed, uh, or how particles or waves are forms of abstraction from this grand flowing wholeness. Uh, okay, so getting into main course here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, torus. There's, uh, how many people out there kind of have an idea what a torus is? Okay. Um, so much like an artist used a torus. Yeah, yeah. Um, so much like an, how an artist uses a uh, canvas to express their artistic trajectories, the torus is a way to kind of um, express the, the rational and irrational frequencies of a system, right? So, um, so the one on the kind of the top right corner is, is kind of like this regular uh, frequency. But what we find, and it's very evident in the psychedelic session because there's so many fractals, is that irregularity is actually, it, it dominates the universe. And so I found myself getting closer to this idea of what that little um, 45 degree angle is, um, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But we, we see the torus throughout nature and the cosmos, right, where, where quasi-periodic frequencies or irregularity uh, forms spirals, chirality, sacred geometries, uh, and reveals that these irrational numbers, uh, again, dominate the universe. So systems kind of do this interesting thing. What we find in nature is they tend to decay towards these uh, fixed point attractors around Torii shapes. Um, I think Terence McKenna talked a lot about the eschaton, the strange attractor. Um, so, um, So yeah, it's an interesting story how I kind of, um, how, how just that one symbol led me into this path of um, quantum physics and porous attractors and strange attractors. So this notion of uh, vortices within vortices, oh, there it is, I actually do have it. So it's kind of like the two lines. I actually met a, a guy at a conference in San Francisco who saw the same thing. I'm like, whoa, you saw that too? He incorporated it into his, uh, he's a, a DJ, so you can see his, the two L's in his word flow there. Um, so this notion of uh, vortices within vortices ad infinitum, imagine eddies in a stream, right, uh, reveals that systems close to turbulence will kind of look similar to themselves at smaller and smaller scales, uh, which suggests that the strange attractor uh, of turbulence is a, is a mirror world. 
Um, and uh, at some point in these bifurcating system parameters, there's a switch to attractor jumping, where the torus itself begins to break apart uh, and it enters into the fractional dimension. So uh, before your very eyes, I'm going to demonstrate a simple dimensional shift from two dimensions to three. So that's an example of um, what we see throughout nature is this sort of tendency to uh, jump, right, uh, either forward or backwards. And um, so the fractional dimension is pulled in nature by the strange attractor, right? It's, it's a sign really of a system's infinitely deep interconnectedness. And I talked about David Baum earlier this great flowing wholeness. There's, there's no separation between the observer and the observed. Um, so turbulence arises because all the uh, pieces of a system are interconnected, right? Um, so iteration or feedback involving this sort of continual reabsorption uh, or unfolding of what has come before crops up in almost everything. Um, Rolling weather systems, artificial intelligence, right? Uh, the cycling replacement of cells in our bodies. Uh, even philosophy, you've got the self-referent paradox. You've probably heard this statement. Um, all Cretans are liars, right? Uh, well, does this Cretan lie? If so, then his statement is false and all Cretans are not liars. Um, uh, but if he's telling the truth, then he too must be a liar. So truth-telling and, and lying kind of swirl around each other. Right, kind of creating this uh, chaos uh, and order in the brain uh, simultaneously. So if you give a statement like that to a computer, it's going to stutter between true and not true and kind of just like maybe fall apart, uh, burn a circuit or something like that. Um, you probably remember the Star Trek episodes where Captain Kirk would uh, give, you know, he would talk to his computer and say, prove that your prime directive is not your prime directive, right? So it would kind of like, fuck up the computer. Um, so for a computer, you know, these paradoxes lead to chaos, but uh, for humans, they're said to have the opposite power, um, leading to creative insight or, or even enlightenment, right? You, uh, Zen Buddhism, you've got these self, uh, these uh, self-looping cones, right, that are, uh, that set the mind oscillating in a way uh, that creates conditions for it to bubble free into a new point of view or a viewless point. Um, so the mind's understanding of truth and falsity kind of uh, continually fold back on each other. I actually introduced several of these Cohen's at the beginning of this talk, um, if you can remember those. So uh, in fact, this entire talk is kind of a subtle Cohen. So by the end of the talk, you'll either wander about aimlessly in a fugue state or gain closer ground toward enlightenment. We'll see. Um, so, and Young talked about this uh, idea of irregularity dominate, dominating the universe. You know, he said that you could take uh, a bed of pebbles and uh, try to get the average weight, right? Uh, or you could say that, that the pebbles weighs an average of 145 grams, but you could not find a single one that weighs exactly 145 grams. Um, so there's nothing but exceptions to the rule. Um, so newer theories like quantum physics believes that, uh, you know, elementary particles kind of generate themselves by this constant process of uh, creation and destruction, right? Brahma and Shiva um, uh, through iteration in, in this vacuum state. So the building blocks of nature don't rest on this kind of static permanence, right? It, it's uh, a rather this dynamic cycling quality uh, where part particles constantly uh, unfold and infold uh, within their um, quantum field. So the, the cells in our body is a great example. You know, a new stomach lining every three or four days, complete replacement of everything every seven years. So we're constantly changing yet remain essentially the same. So we can't, you know, escape this really fascinating mirror world. So we're kind of immersed in this, you know, a um, uh, world of, of balance and disruption and uh, transmutation and evolution, uh, complexity and simplicity. And, you know, I, I, 
as a counselor, I see some of the most negative aspects of life. Um, you know, obstacles, death, uh, pain as important components to life. You know, generating motivation, sculpting character, uh, building creativity. And, you know, it's interesting to note about creativity. You know, there's this old saying that when you pluck the fruit of creativity from the golden tree, the other hand plucks um, destruction, right? So it's this, oh, this balance. That's why sometimes you see the uh, artists who get into drugs and alcohol, right? It's it's the shadow side. Um, okay, so I'm really interested in shadow work, how this applies to um, the realm of psychology and counseling. Um, I often do a lot of shadow work uh, with clients, and um, so if you know if you think about it the discoveries that could be made in the realm of the unconscious are uh, kind of like those that are most feared um but shadow work is the most important work you know it leads to wholeness and integration and you know the the ayahuasca uh, many many ayahuasca sessions have taught me that so, um uh hit, hitting it head on you know um and that's what my, my research study was based on was um dealing with stressors uh, Doing that shadow work uh, so important to that. So, uh, and then we uh, apply this to culture, uh, where you know maybe culture is kind of a linear phase space, and uh, psychedelics kind of represent that um, that quasi periodic frequency. You know, um, Terence McKenna. I always remembered a statement about culture is not your friend, and uh, you know I would say I, I agree with that, but I'd like to take that a step further. You know, I mean, culture kind of redeems us from that animal state. Um, it takes the simple human in us and it gives us more complex and sophisticated power. Um, it sets up a steeper gradient for that, you know, that heroic Campbellian journey. Um, so in some sense, it's necessary, I think. Um, but it also levels the gold within that shadow. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, hero worship, I think, is so big in our culture today. You see all these Marvel comic movies. It's uh, pure shadow, um, uh, representing the refusal to bear our most noble traits. So, um, and I love Buckminster Fuller's quotes. You know, he said something about, um, in our culture, we have inspectors making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. That kind of, like, represents the linearity of our culture. Um, but we also have this kind of ramp, rampant uh, cynicism uh, that represents this kind of scarcity of being, right? This feeling of, I'm not enough. There's not enough life. Um, a, a consequence of our, you know, alienation, our uh, abandonment to this kind of dead, purposeless universe of force and mass and gas and dead dust. And that's why I think the psychedelics are important because it, reveals to us that the miraculous uh, uh, elements of nature, right, uh, and reveals that there is purpose and intention to the universe. Five, okay. Um, so I think we must embrace the kind of the absurdity and, and miraculous nature uh, of our existence as we begin to forge our own story. So, the you know, another great example of this. Cabal, the Illuminati, um, true or not, you know the the, the conspiracies kind of express a psychological uh, truth. They they give voice to this feeling of, of helplessness and rage and uh, um, just kind of rage of being cast into a world ruled by uh, institutions and ideologies that don't serve human well-being. Um, so. It also represents the shadow aspect of ourselves, right? Dri driven to dominate and control uh, this, this, um, you know, this idea of something awful is taking over the world. Um, and this is what I love about Kafka. Uh, he, he writes not about the absurdity of bureaucracy, um, but the kind of um, the ir irony of the char character's circular reasoning in response to that. Right, and uh, it's kind of like this tragic comic mythology for the modern industrial um, age, um, and uh, you know, so by fine tuning, what Kafka does is he kind of fine tunes our attention to the absurd, um, 
and reminds us that the world we live in is the one we create and have the ability to change for the better. Um, so we uh, achieve by embracing, you know, I think irrationality, fear to access new conditions. Uh, it's about living like generatively, um, you know, standing at the fulcrum, finding the balance. Uh, and when we embrace fear, failure, and the unknown, uh, the universe will open doors where there were walls, right? Um, and if you think about medieval heroes, they had to slay their dragons, but modern heroes have to take them home and, and integrate them into their personality, right? So, um, and that's why integration and containers and intention are so important, I think, to the psychedelic um, session. Um, so, you know, I think it's time to engage in what I call acts of cultural assassination. You know, uh, am I insane? Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, you know, insofar as sanity is a socially constructed category that serves the maintenance of dominant narratives and, and power structures, it's time to be insane together, you know, violate consensus reality. Um, so, yeah, is that time? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, three minutes. Okay. So, um, I just wanted to dedicate this presentation to a mirror jumper and a shadow dancer. Where's Bailey? He, he, just, he figured it out. He figured it out in the end, you know? Uh, and, and so I honor that, his character, <laughs> for uh, imparting such wisdom. Uh, you know, um, it took a lot of pain and struggle, which is kind of like grist for the Enlightenment mill. Um, and he became his own angel. He jumped through the mirror. He embraced his shadow and began to live in the present moment. Uh, so it was kind of this alchemical transmutation, you know, the, the snags of pain and suffering into the, you can say, the pirouetting light ballet of consciousness. Uh, I also want to dedicate this, I have this picture. Uh, I always dedicate Martin Ball for, you know, getting the ball rolling. And this is kind of where I started my talks, but, He's the ultimate uh, mirror jumper, shadow dancer, uh, weaver of fine threads and cosmic corduroys. Uh, so hats off to you, Martin Ball, wherever you are. And uh, so, yeah, so get out there and, you know, iterate, uh, get irregular. And uh, with that, quad erit demonstratum. I've been wonderful and so have you. And good night and good luck in everything that you do. One more time for Justin Panic, please.